Jacob through his wives has 12 sons and these are the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. And soon my dear brothers and sisters we will see that the covenant that God made with Abraham is truly unfolding. What was the covenant about? That I will make you a father of many nations. I will give you descendants as many as the stars in heaven, as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. And that is exactly what is unfolding. We see this whole aspect already in the fact that Jacob has 12 sons, the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we fast forward to Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob. And Joseph is very important for us because there will be a lot of parables between this Joseph and the Joseph of the Gospels, the husband of Mary. But there will also be parallels between Joseph and Jesus. But more importantly, let's listen to the story of Joseph. What happens with the story of Joseph? He is his father's favorite child. And so his father stitches him a coat of many colors, a long sleeved coat. And Joseph is a dreamer. He has many dreams and he believes in these dreams. Joseph is a dreamer, but his brothers get very upset because all his dreams speak of his dominance, that he is going to save his brothers. And they are so full of jealousy that they actually sell him off for 20 shekels of silver. And so my dear brothers and sisters, as Joseph goes from being son to slave, the same thing will also happen to the sons of Israel. And from slave, he goes, ends up in the jail of Pharaoh. And from there, because he is able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, he is raised to the level of the prime minister of Egypt. From being a son, to being a slave, to being in prison, and to being the prime minister of Egypt. A powerful, a very, very powerful position. My dear brothers and sisters, this is how what life is about. When you and I face the ups and downs in, lives, in our lives, we are called to remember the story of Joseph. Joseph had his ups and downs, but he never ever doubted God. He had his faith in God and that faith is something that saw him through the ups and downs of life. It's an invitation for you and me to also have faith in this loving God. We see, my dear brothers and sisters, that this Joseph, who was sold as a slave, is also the one who saves his brothers. How? When he is in Egypt, Pharaoh has a dream. And this dream is, he sees five fattened cattle, five fattened cows. And afterwards, he also sees five very thin, thin cows. And in his dream, he sees something very startling. The thin cows eat the fattened cows. And he is disturbed with this dream. And Joseph interprets his dream as God blessing Egypt with seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And so he asks Pharaoh to take precautions to make sure that things are in store for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh in his turn tells Joseph to do whatever he wants, gives him complete authority and what Joseph does is for the seven years of plenty, he builds granaries and he stocks grain. He just keeps stocking grain. And then when the famine hits the land, the whole world goes through a famine, we are told. And when we speak of the whole world, we are speaking basically of Palestine, Egypt, the Middle East, that region. Everyone undergoes a famine. And this famine is also felt in Palestine or Israel. And Israel, Jacob, who is now Israel, sends his son to Egypt to buy grain because they have no grain. Egypt is the only place where grain is available thanks to Joseph's interpretation 
of the dream that Pharaoh had. What do we see here? We see that Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers do not recognize him. Does this ring a bell? Yes, this is a prefigurement of what happens to Jesus. Jesus recognizes you and me, but very often we do not recognize Jesus. His own brothers did not recognize him. The Gospel of St. John will tell us, he came to his own and his own did not know him. My dear brothers and sisters, we see a lot of parallels and we'll come to that soon. But let's continue with the story. The story tells us that Joseph now wants to know whether his father is still alive. And so he works out an entire plot and he brings his father to Egypt. And Joseph reveals himself to his brothers that he is Joseph whom they sold. And when they hear this, they are trembling because now this Joseph whom they sold is the prime minister of Egypt. He is second in command. He is next only to the Pharaoh. And if he wishes, he can have all of them slaughtered. But that is not what Joseph does. What does Joseph do? He says, look, this is all God's plan. God sent me ahead of you to prepare the way for you so that I may be able to indeed save you. This is all God's doing. Joseph shows a great magnanimity of heart. And Joseph, my dear brothers and sisters, is a parallel for Jesus. Notice that Jesus was also sold, was also betrayed by one of the twelve, Judas, one of his apostles, one of his brothers. Just as Joseph was sold for 20, 20 silver shekels, so too will Jesus be sold for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And just as Joseph was responsible for saving his brothers, Jesus will also be responsible for saving not just the apostles, but the whole world. And we will see in Jesus the fulfillment of the story of Abraham, the fulfillment of the blessings given to Abraham. In your descendants, the entire world will receive its blessing. As Jesus comes up on the scene, the whole world is what receives the blessing through Jesus. As we look at the story of Joseph, my dear brothers and sisters, at one point in time, Joseph dies and Joseph is buried. But during this time that he and his brothers are in Egypt, the Egyptians are wary of the descendants of Joseph. Why? Because the Hebrews, as they are called, are so numerous that they are probably as many as the Egyptians. And the later pharaohs do not know about Joseph, we are told. And so, one of the pharaohs, he is very, very afraid. He thinks because of his insecurity, he believes that if you don't do something about these Hebrews, they will soon rule over Egypt and the Egyptians will be their slaves. And so what does he do? He enforces hard labor on them. He binds them with slavery and he uses the Hebrews to build his cities, etc. Till such time that God listens to his servant's cry, to the cry of the Hebrews. And he raises up a savior. Who is the savior? Moses. And when does God raise the savior? Exactly 430 years after they came into Egypt. Of these 430 years, they were privileged guests for 30 long years. And then for 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. Remember what God promised Moses, what God promised Abraham? That your descendants will be slaves and I will deliver them after 400 years. Exactly after 400 years, God keeps his promise. God works to save the Israelites. God works to change their situation. God works to save them and now take them to the promised land 
that he had promised Abraham their father in faith. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as we go along, we will listen more and more to these things. Let us now prepare to listen to the story of Moses. We have the story of Moses that perhaps all of us are aware of. The Pharaoh, knowing that the Hebrews are increasing in number, passes an edict. And as for this edict, all the Hebrew midwives are supposed to throw the newborn Hebrew males into the river Nile. They're supposed to kill them by drowning. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, one such Hebrew family gives birth to a male son. And this son is Moses. But the mother doesn't want to throw the child into the river Nile. And so what does she do? She makes a basket out of papyrus reed. And she coats it on the inside and outside with pitch and she places the baby in that. And then she puts the baby on the river Nile and hides him among the reeds that grow there. And his sister, the baby sister Miriam, watches over to see that no one harms the baby. What does this remind us of? Yes, it reminds us of what has happened earlier, the story of Noah and the ark. Just as God saved Noah, and his family through the ark. So too now will God save Moses. And notice it is no coincidence of how the description of the ark and the description of the wicker basket made with reeds is so similar. The ark God tells Noah to paint it on the inside out with pitch to make it watertight, to make it waterproof. And that's exactly what is also done for the basket in which Moses is placed. And just as Noah and his family are floating on the waters of destruction, <coughs> so too we have Moses floating on the waters of the river Nile, a water that was meant to destroy all other Hebrew males. This same water becomes a source of salvation for Moses. Moses, my dear brothers and sisters, is found Pharaoh's daughter and he is brought up in Egypt, in Pharaoh's palace itself. What a coincidence. Pharaoh wants the Hebrew children to die and here is a Hebrew child who grows up right under Pharaoh's nose and Pharaoh is none the wiser about it. What does this tell us? That when God chooses to do something, Nobody, absolutely nobody can stand in the way of that. God chooses to use Moses. God chooses that Moses should go to Egypt, not as a slave, but he should live in the household of Pharaoh and he should grow up to be a prince and trained in every way that princes are trained. Why? Because God is soon going to use Moses. And all these skills will come in handy to deliver his people from slavery and bondage. Remember, they are going to spend a long time in the wilderness and they need a leader who is thoroughly capable. And Moses learns everything about leadership in the palace. Remember, he is supposed to have been slaughtered by drowning in the Nile. But he is saved from the Nile. He is brought up in the palace and he is taught everything that a prince needs to know. Now Moses sees two Hebrews fighting and he goes and questions them. But before this, he has seen one of the taskmasters being very, very harsh with one of the Hebrew slaves. And so he strikes the taskmaster, kills him and buries him in the sand. Now that is a very, very serious crime. To kill an Egyptian is a capital crime that calls for capital punishment. And Moses thinks that no one has seen the crime. And then we have Moses who sees these two Hebrews fighting. 
and he goes to separate them and says, aren't you all brothers? Why are you all fighting? <coughs> Why are you all fighting with each other? And one of the Hebrews says, what are you going to do with us? Are you going to kill us like you killed that e Egyptian? It is then that Moses realizes that somebody has noticed 